You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 317, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Education for Special Needs, The Curative Education Course. Twelve lectures, translated by Anna Moyes. This is the last lecture, Lecture 12, given in Dornach on the 7th of July, 1924. Let me hear your wishes to begin with, and then I'll have to bring the course to a conclusion. So please tell me now the burning questions in your hearts so that we may continue to progress. Bracket, Albrecht Strohlsheim, I would say that we have no further questions. Close bracket. Steiner again. Our subject matter in these discussions has been how we may deepen our Waldorf education to arrive at methods of education that take us to the child who is said to be abnormal. You will have seen that we must immediately use a different assessment if that child is to have the appropriate treatment as distinct from the, in quotes, normal child, but that those who bring up and educate these children must also assess them in a way that differs from the views of lay people, where the tendency is to point to the anomaly and not go further into what is really behind it. People are today still far from the point reached in a relatively elementary way by Goethe, in contemplating plant growth, the nature of plants. Goethe specially delighted in seeing malformations develop in plants. Among the most interesting papers written by Goethe are those dealing with malformations, where some organ of the plant, which we are used to seeing in a particular, in quotes, normal form, grows excessive in size or differentiates in an unusual way, or at times produces organs in the wrong place, and so on. It is exactly because a plant can produce such malformations that Goethe found the best pointers to arrive at the actual idea of the archetypal plant. For he knew that the idea behind the plant shows itself especially in such malformations. If we were to consider a number of observations made on plants as to how the root may be malformed, how the leaf, the stem, the flower, and also the fruits may be malformed. One must, of course, study a number of plants. We would, in surveying them, all actually see the archetypal plant in them. And essentially that is how it is with all living things, including those that live in the spirit. We come to see more and more that the principle which lives behind the human race also comes to expression in anomalies, that the spiritual principle in the human race reveals this outwardly. And when we look at things in this way, we will also find how people thought and what views they held in earlier times, when education was considered to be very close to healing activity. Healing was seen as things created by Lucifer and Araman being taken toward the principle which keeps the middle position between Luciferic and Aramonic, with the good spiritual element continuing on. Equilibrium between Aramonic and Luciferic, that was healing. When it was seen from a much higher point of view that human beings need to be taken into that equilibrium in the course of life by education, people would also, in a sense, still see something anomalous in the child, something which in a certain respect is actually sick and needs to be healed. And the original words for healing and education therefore had exactly the same meaning. Education heals the, in quotes, normal individual, and healing is merely a specialized form of this for, in quotes, abnormal people. It is, of course, perfectly natural that if you consider such a basis to be correct, you also have to continue in that direction and put more questions. With every illness that comes from within, we are really dealing with something of a spiritual nature. And we ultimately do so also with any illness 
that develops in the organism following an external injury. Even breaking your leg is a reaction of the inner to the outer, and surgeons would do well to let such a view bear fruit in their minds. Giving thought to these things, we do, to a much greater degree, arrive at the question as to how we should treat the child in the whole of our physical approach, as well as in soul and spirit. Both are closely bound up, especially in children, and you should not think that if you give some medicinal substance to a child, this will only have a physical effect, which is what people tend to think today. A substance has a considerably more spiritual action in a child than it does later in the adult. The action of mother's milk is that in it lives something which in earlier times was called the, quote, good mummy, close quote. Footnote, meaning a preserved body, not a mum. End of footnote. As distinct from the bad mummy, which lives in other secretions. The whole mother lives in her milk. We have something living in there as a power, which has really only changed its region within the human organization. Up to the birth of the child, it is essentially active in the region, which belongs mainly to the system of metabolism and limbs. After birth, it is essentially active in the region of the rhythmic system. Those powers, therefore, move up one floor in the organization. In doing so, they lose their I content, which has been mainly active during the embryonic period, but they retain their astral content. When the powers which are active in mother's milk go yet another floor up, as far as the head, they lose their astral content as well, and would then have only physical and etheric organization active in them. This is the cause of the harmful effects on the mother when these powers rise to the higher level. We then see all the anomalous phenomena which the mother develops. In mother's milk we thus still have astral, form-giving powers that are certainly spiritual in their actions. And we have to consider the responsibility we take on when we let the child make the transition to feeding himself. For there is no longer any awareness today of the spiritual which is really active everywhere in the outside world. How, ascending from root to flower and fruit, the plant grows more and more spiritual and acts spiritually. If we start with the root, we have something which as root is initially least spiritual in its actions. The root has a relatively strong physical and etheric relationship to the whole of its surroundings. But in the flower, a life is beginning that stretches out for the astral as if longing for it. The plant gets more spiritual as it grows. We therefore have to ask a further question. How does the root of the plant relate to the whole cosmos? Well, my friends, this root is in the soil the way our head is in the open air and in the light. So we may say... Down here we have the head principle, sensory perception, in the plant. Up here we have the plant's digestive and nourishing principle, see plate 15. Up here in the plant we have the principle, which contains the spirituality longed for by the system of metabolism and limbs, and is therefore also related to the human system of metabolism and limbs. If we look at mother's milk on the one hand, and the astral element longed for by the plant, which is floating above the plant, an occult view is gained of a tremendously close relationship, not complete identity, of the particular astrality which comes from the mother in her milk, and the astrality which floats toward the flower of a plant from the cosmos. I am not telling you all these things to provide you with some theoretical knowledge, but so that you develop the right feelings for everything there is around human beings and enters into the sphere of their doing, their activities. We will have to endeavor gradually to get the child used to ordinary foods 
so that we stimulate it with the fruiting principle, support his metabolic system with the flowering principle, and anything he has to manage from the head by gently adding in the root principle. I'd say that these things should only be studied theoretically to start us off. In practice, they must flow into our way of handling the situation, doing so in a spiritual way. You see, there is also the fact that it is extraordinarily difficult today to gain any insight into the human being on the basis of things one learns, learns in all areas. The I, E-Y-E, is always deflected from the very things that matter. People are not trained to consider the things that matter today. It is true indeed that the ability to see the things that matter died off in the first half of the 19th century. There was still some idea in the first half of the 19th century, but today it only survives in language, in the genius of language. We might characterize it more or less as follows. Looking at the human race, one sees that there are many different diseases. We could make a list of them if we wanted to stay in the abstract. We might then, writing them onto the plain surface, create a kind of map, related diseases in one corner, fatal diseases in another, making a nice arrangement. This would result in a map of diseases with special attention paid to where a child fits in who is organized in a particular way. And we might imagine writing pathological tendencies schematically on sheets of waxed paper and writing the name of a child where it belongs. Imagine one had such an idea and one did this. In the first half of the 19th century, people still had the idea that one ought to put down the names of animals where the diseases were meant to be written down. The view was that the animal world inscribes all kinds of diseases in nature. Every animal, seen in the right way, signifies a disease. The disease is healthy in the animal, as it were. If this animal enters into the human being, rather than its own organization, if the human being tends in the direction of the animal's organization, then he or she is sick. Ideas like these lived in the minds, not just of superstitious people, in the first half of the 19th century. Even Hegel thought that way, and it was a perfectly useful idea. Just consider how well it describes the nature of someone when you say that he's like a lion, an eagle, or bovine, or also that he is going in a direction where the human being is forcibly taken into a condition that is too spiritual. Or, if you take things further, understanding that when, let us say, the ether body grows, in quotes, too soft, you get strict affinity of the ether body to physical matter, you'll then find a suggestion in a human being of an organization that should be found only in the lower animal world. These are fundamental ideas which you must make your own. The personal development you will need to be a teacher is something like the following. You may begin with quite specific meditations. The meditation I have given you here is particularly powerful. You will realize how fruitful the meditation which you practice with a certain inner orientation proves to be when it is as if you are in your feelings carried, driven as if on the waves of an astral sea, out of the body, into a world which then appears before you, billowing gently and makes it possible for you to see things around you that will provide answers to your questions. To make such things possible, you merely must not just hold fast theoretically to the preconditions given for meditative development in titled knowledge of the higher worlds, how to know higher worlds, and elsewhere. You know, people say the obstacle to such development is human egotism. With people focusing too much on their own self in forming opinions. For just consider what focusing on your own self really means. We have our physical body, which goes back to Saturn times, has been crafted with great skill through four stages of a majestic quality. We have our etheric body, three times transformed with great skill, 
we have our astral body, which has been transformed twice. None of them come into the sphere of the conscious mind on earth. Only the eye does so. But it is really only a reflection of the eye, for we will only see the true eye on looking back into an earlier incarnation. The present one is still evolving and will only be reality in the next incarnation. The eye is only the baby. And when someone is really wallowing in his egotism, those who have gained insight see a sensuous, wet nurse who looks on the infant in sensual pleasure. In that case, sensuousness has its justification, for the child is another individual. But we now have the image which is opposite to egotism, with the individual cuddling the infant. Today people go about in such a way, and if we were to paint an astral portrait, it would have to be such that they carry the child on their arm. The ancient Egyptians were still able to create the well-known scarab, where their own eye was at least borne by the head organization. Modern people bear their own eye on their arm, cuddling it, To compare this image with one's daily activities is another extraordinarily useful meditation for teachers. You are then taken into what I have called, quote, floating in the spiritual waves, close quote. To have your questions answered when looking at things in this way does, of course, call for one to be inwardly at peace. And you must seek to preserve this for yourself. You will immediately see if someone is made in such a way that they go through some kind of development in this direction. You recognize this from whether the person complains of obstacles or not. People in the process of development never complain that this or that might prove an obstacle. It may happen that someone meditates most effectively before an important act, which then follows immediately, or, again, after an important act, completely forgetting what they experienced in the act. For this is what matters, that it is in your power to tear yourself away from the one world and find your way into the other world. And that is the absolute beginning when calling up one's inner powers. Observe the difference if you are more or less indifferent in approaching the child, or if you do so with real love. Education will immediately prove effective, especially with special needs children, when you have come to it with real love, no longer thinking that technical skills will achieve more than genuine love for the child does. The truth is that a particular attitude should come into flower every time the foundations are laid for special ways of doing something within the anthroposophical movement. The things that are suggested should really be considered to be merely the roots from which the attitude plant will grow. And there, it is really necessary that people are, above all, sentient of the substantially anthroposophical element as a reality. You will not achieve anything, this we can say before you even start, if you simply take what you have learned here as something one learns but which does not lead to a particular attitude. That has been the precondition, which I'd say was self-understood at the time, but is even more a matter of course as time goes on, for the body which, since the Christmas conference, is meant to exist as the anthroposophical society. The things coming from the Gertianum and its institutions have to be seen to be absolutely real, and in future it can only be that everything by way of anthroposophical work comes from there through the sections. For according to everything you gather from such discussions, this anthroposophical society is meant to develop into an organism in which the different spheres of responsibility act as the life-blood. These things will come together in the right way, if you are sentient and aware of them in the right way. Just as heart and kidneys have to work together for certain organizational functions in the human organism to achieve consistency, so the sections must work together to achieve the particular goal you are seeking each of them cultivating the subject area for which it is responsible. People who undertake something in the world must let the fruits of section work act together 
in what they do. And we must see the anthroposophical work as something that is very real. Imagine you intend to work for children with special needs. You must then, first of all, consider the educational stream which is alive in the anthroposophical movement. The educational stream must become part of your own work the way it is. You have to understand that what you find there has to do with healing the typical human being so that he finds his place in the world. Next, you have to realize that only the medical section can give you the things that can deepen education in the direction of people with anomalies. If you enter into this in the right way, you will soon find out for yourself that this cannot be provided by saying that this is good for this and that is good for that, but only by having a relationship that is full of life. Tearing such a living relationship apart is something that should not happen. No egotism should come into work in a special field, but only the longing to be part of the whole. When eurythmy therapy comes into special education, it is again the whole of eurythmy which comes into special education. You should see from this that in this direction too a living relationship must develop, and it should also be evident from this that up to a degree someone who is providing eurythmy therapy should also have the basics of eurythmy. Eurythmy therapy should grow from general knowledge of both speech and tone eurythmy. Above all, you have to get through to the human being, connect with the human being. And for this reason, eurythmy therapy should never be given without consulting a physician. It has been made a condition when eurythmy therapy was introduced that it should not be given unless you also contact the physician. All this does indicate how the things that arise in anthroposophy interrelate, coming together in a living way. There is something else as well. In future, a decision will have to be made in the Anthroposophical Society, which seriously goes in the following direction. Should particular responsibilities be maintained, or should they not be maintained? You don't have to believe this, but can see it from everything that is happening. At the time when the Christmas conference was to be arranged, these responsibilities were closely considered with an exclusivity that some may feel to have been cruel an exclusivity concerning the quality of the individuals who were there, this being the basis on which the council at the Gertianum was appointed. There is no other way but to consider this council within the context of what goes on in the anthroposophical society as the body which has full authority. For the individual things and issues, this council must be considered the ruling body. Will this be understood in future? within the anthroposophical movement or not. This is something which has to be said as a way of laying a foundation stone when a center such as yours is established. If the critical attitude which exists among people does not stop, for criticism never relates to the subject matter taught, but to the actual work done. If an authority principle does not truly exist, not in the teaching but in the work done, especially with regard to the things where occult influences come in, the anthroposophical movement will not become what it simply must become if it is to survive. The surreptitious way of going against those who have taken responsibility is something that must not continue in future. Membership of the School of Spiritual Science will have to provide the necessary correction in that school membership will have to end if there is no proper understanding. We might say that before the Christmas conference, we did not have a council prepared to work esoterically, and the thinking and feeling was left to me. Everyone made extensive use of whatever they wished from the society, the will impulse. That was the basic phenomenon until the Christmas conference. When people wanted to turn to the thinking or also the feeling in anthroposophical matters, They would come to me more or less the way you go to the shoemaker to have a pair of boots made. This was so all the more, as people did not realize this, but believed the opposite to be the case. The whole can only be restored to health 
if people become aware that there is also a will principle for the society, which is coming from the council at the Gertianum. And people will be able to accept this with understanding and not under compulsion. But the way of thinking is most strange. It sticks so much to the word. Yesterday I had a grotesque instance of the way people are everywhere sticking to the word, and things are blown up and get heated when the longing to do something arises. I am supposed to have said about the Council of the Independent Anthroposophical Society when I was in Breslau that the others had now gone and the rump council remained. The opinion which immediately arose was this. This is a rump council, and there has to be a head. Well, you see, behind this lies the fact that people cling to the word, that because the head has for once been called a rump here, based on common usage, people cling to this word, utterly failing to realize that for the time being the council at the Gertianum is in complete agreement with this so-called rump council. Otherwise, they would have said, in quotes, lousy or whatever. Since they did not say lousy, it is a fact that they are, for the time being, in agreement. It is all a matter of basing your opinion on the facts. This is of the greatest importance if we are to manage with the anthroposophical movement. It is therefore necessary for you to see the enterprise you are establishing in Lauenstein, and we can have the greatest hopes for this, as something that functions in complete harmony with the whole anthroposophical movement. That, on the one hand, you are fully aware that the anthroposophical movement will support and nurture anything to which they have given their wholehearted agreement, but will only be able to do this in so far as it is in accord with its institutions of today, following the Christmas conference. On the other hand, it must also be the case that such a part of the movement, on its part, does whatever adds to the strength of the anthroposophical movement. This is what I would warmly commend to you, my friends. Please take these heartfelt words as something I want to give to you to take with you as the impulse which will undoubtedly continue to bear fruit. If within a spiritual movement you seek to make this movement bear fruit in everyday life, then we can consider this movement to have life. So much then, to give your will, strength, guidance and the power to be effective. My dear friends, the end of Lecture 12, and that is the end of the cycle, uh, Collected Works, Volume 317, Education for Special Needs, the Curative Education Course, 12 Lectures, translated by Anna Moist by Rudolf Steiner.